welcome. Uh, again, welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we know it's a, a very busy time and everyone's got lots of things going on and it's uh, also, you know, time to take out for a virtual activity. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, first and foremost, I uh, want to congratulate all of you uh, for being admitted to McGill, working so hard through your schooling uh, to get to this uh, point of, of your journey. But also congratulations for just persevering through this pandemic with your academics, uh, as well as going through the process of arriving at McGill. Uh, we know that being admitted is the first hurdle, but maybe the next few hurdles would be figuring out housing and course registration and even just physically arriving in Montreal. Uh, it's a lot to take in. So congratulations on all of that. Uh, we are really, really thrilled uh, and excited uh, to welcome you to uh, the McGill community. My name is Jen and I work in the Enrollment Service Office in the admissions and recruitment side of things. Uh, so normally I'm greeting you prior uh, to admission at McGill, but I'm super, super excited uh, to join this panel uh, and help moderate some of the questions coming in uh, with a super stellar team uh, of uh, individuals here that we're going to be introducing shortly. This event is organized by Alumni Relations, another super, superstar team that we work with and that really do work in connecting um, McGillians around the world, uh, where we are 180 countries represented, over 200,000 um, living McGillians. So it's a really exciting team to be part of. And this send off itself is part of a bigger uh, plan in terms of keeping you connected. So at the end of the session, I uh, will tell you about some upcoming uh, networking events that are going to be taking place. So just to start off with on the logistical side of things, uh, many of you, of course, are familiar with this platform, GoToWebinar, and just wanted to mention that when you see your control panel, perhaps on the right hand side of your screen, um, you should see a chat function with a little um, triangle arrow. So if you click on that, that should open up a box that if you do have questions for us uh, as we're going through the presentation, you're welcome to put them in the chat, hit submit, and uh, we have amazing staff behind the scenes that will be typing some of those responses to you. So you might follow that chat. Um, but if it is a question that we're getting often, and I bet we can predict some of those questions that are coming up, uh, we will use that time to actually ask the questions verbally to our panelists. So both are happening, some verbal uh, responses as well as some typed responses. So feel free to monitor that chat. And absolutely, there will be some very important links uh, shared in the chat as well, especially about immigration, arriving on campus in the fall, and lots of important details you might need. Um, so if we don't have the information, we're going to share it with you in that chat. So it's important to watch that. And then also in that panel, you should see a handout feature. So if you click on that button, um, it will expand as well. And uh, you will find some three different handouts that will help you prepare again for that arrival on campus. So hopefully that will um, be uh, some of the housekeeping that we have. Uh, the session is about an hour long. Um, we have a presentation coming up and then afterwards we're gonna go into um, some Q and A with our amazing panelists. So I think we should just jump right in. And uh, first we're gonna have Caitlin uh, from our campus life and engagement team, just walk you through some over, like overarching um, aspects of student services and some of those important details uh, to prep for your arrival uh, for campus September, 2021. And then we have three McGillians that will be joining us as well. Um, Sasha, a current student, uh, Louisa, a current student, and Catherine, uh, a proud McGillian and mom uh, of a current student. So uh, between all of us, between the logistical side of McGill and the fun side of McGill, uh, we'll be able to uh, help answer your questions. So at this moment, let's get it all started. Caitlin is going to take over and uh, share some important information about student services and campus life engagement. So over to you, Caitlin. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, so before I jump into the presentation, we're just gonna do another quick poll. And this question is going to ask you about what you wanna get out of this presentation. So you should see a poll on your screens right now. If you could just take a few seconds to answer, what would you like to learn? What would you like to get out of today's presentation? So I'll just give everyone a few seconds. There's a few options to choose from. And I feel like that should be enough time. 
Rula, if you'd like to close the poll, share the results. Okay, so, you know, pretty evenly split. So a lot of, I think the winning um, result is the preparatory ideas for fall semester, and then followed closely by tips from current students, support services to ease transition, and also making the most of the McGill experience. And honestly, all of those things, I think, constitute learning new things. So there you go. So yeah, I'm just going to share my screen now, and we will get started with my presentation. So this presentation is going to be about first year tips to success. So before I get too ahead of myself, like Jen said, my name is Caitlin Marotra. My role at McGill is as undergraduate programs coordinator for campus life and engagement. I work on orientation and transition programs for new students. So I'm one of the main people, um, you know, coordinating and planning and bringing you orientation week and a fun and safe sort of frosh experience. So this event today, I just wanna give a shout out to our wonderful hosts, the amazing McGill Alumni Services. So I feel like when a lot of people think of the McGill Alumni Association, oops, um, they think it's just for graduates, uh, you know, people who are done McGill, but that is absolutely not true. Uh, you know, the Alumni Association is also definitely for new McGill parents and new students as well. They have a lot of programming that will help you uh, transition to the university, like this event, for example, they do these wonderful send-offs every year. Uh, you know, they also provide parents with a lot of wonderful opportunities to connect to other parents. So if there's any, if there's any parents in the audience today, you can definitely take note of that. Um, so be sure to check out their wonderful site and their suite of programming that is available on their website. We have um, put a QR code on the slide for your convenience. So if you um, take out your phone and you have a little camera app open and you hold it over the QR code, it should pull up the website automatically. I also wanted to talk about Campus Life and Engagement, which is the department that I work at at McGill. So um, we also go by the name Clay. Um, so Campus Life and Engagement is basically the office dedicated to supporting new students and transition. Um, we encourage and promote co-curricular opportunities. Um, we have a heavy focus on promoting engagement opportunities as well. Our goal is basically just to empower a student's capacity to make positive change in their own lives on campus, um, as well as in their communities. Like I said, we have a focus on first year. Um, so this is our version of the McGill student life cycle. You know, so from the time that you apply to orientation week to when you enter university, all the way up until you graduate, you know, we are here to support you. Um, and like I said, um, our focus on first year support is just to help you sort of seamlessly transition to life at university. And instead of giving a sort of traditional presentation, what I have done is recruited some helpers, some student staff at campus life and engagement that we have that have gone through everything that you're about to experience. You know, they were once first year students as well. And so using their narratives as, as sort of tips, uh, I'm going to introduce you to some of the many services and resources at McGill. Now I'm gonna go fairly quickly for the sake of time. I know the meat of this presentation is gonna be the panel. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly, but like Jen mentioned, we have a handout section um, in the GoToWebinar control panel. And this presentation is actually linked in that handout section. So if I'm going a bit fast or you wanna go back and refer to something that I've mentioned, you can download that, uh, pull that up on your own computer and you'll, you'll have access to it. So the first student that I wanna introduce you to is Gilbert. So this is Gilbert's testimonial. Now again, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna read these out, but I'm gonna highlight the services that Gilbert took advantage of as a first year student. So he mentions residence councils, he mentions the Science Undergraduate Society, and he also mentions the International Buddy Program. So just to go over those a little bit. So Gilbert said that he was involved in the Student Society of McGill University. Um, they have a wonderful first year council, which you may be interested in getting involved with and also representing uh, your fellow first year students. SMU also has over 200 clubs and services available to you, including many of my favorites like the Chocolate Club and the McGill Students Culinary Society. Um, Gilbert also brought up residence life where you can get involved as a floor rep for your floor on one of our various residence councils. There's also um, the Inter International Buddy Program, which is admin administered by International Student Services. As International Student Services, the ISS is something that you will probably be um, 
visiting or using their services quite a lot. So it's for the Buddy program is for new international students. Um, it's a mentorship program, and it provides um, you know you can just it gives you a chance to connect with upper year students who have been in similar situations. Um, you can go to them if you have questions about you know life at McGill, life in Canada in general. Um, the ISS also provides information about um, international health insurance, as well as immigration advisors. So if you have any immigration questions, they are the people to go to. Lastly, Gilbert mentioned the Science Undergraduate Society, also SUS, um, which has a first year council, the Freshman Undergraduate Science Society. Um, there are different undergraduate societies for every faculty, so be sure to check out your faculty's undergraduate society. They are entirely student run. They host a lot of events. They all have first year councils, so it's a really great way for first year students to get involved if they are looking to meet people in their faculty. Next, we're gonna introduce you to Katya. Katya is a current student doing a Bachelor of Arts. Now, Katya um, has made use, during her time of McGill, has, uh, has made use of CAPS, uh, which is our career and planning service. She's also made use of Arts Oasis, which is the Arts um, Undergraduate Advising Office. She has worked for a campus newspaper, the McGill Tribune. She's also attended Skills 21 workshops and has visited the SSAO and met with a finance counselor. So now let's go over uh, those services in a little bit more detail. So starting with Arts Oasis, um, like I mentioned, it's the Arts Student Affairs Office where you can find your faculty academic advisors. Um, you know, your academic advisors will be your new best friends at McGill. They're gonna help you plan out your degree, support you throughout your studies, make sure you're on track for graduation. They can also help you um, find internship opportunities. Katya mentioned Skills 21, um, which is a skills development program uh, available exclusively to McGill students. Um, you can take you know, leadership workshops, workshops on equity, wellness, there's tons of different options. Um, a great way to uh, you know, improve your skill set and add even skills to your resume. She also mentioned the scholarships and student aid office. Um, you know, we think it's not just about scholarships and student aid, um, although that is a big part of what they do. They also have very skilled financial counselors that can help you in general with budgeting. Um, they have a frugal scholars program to help you manage your money. They have a work study program for students who are on um, my maximum financial aid but can still work and study at the university at the same time. Katya also mentions the career and planning services where you can meet with a career advisor, you can get your CV checked over, you can talk to them about career goals that you may have. They also run the My Future job posting platform as well as My Involvement which is administered by um, CAPS as well which hosts the co-curricular record uh, where you can document, you can get official documentation for all of your extracurricular activities. Uh, Next, we're going to talk about Sam. So Sam is actually a PhD student in her third year. Um, she also teaches courses uh, with her um, with her department, sorry. And this is some of the advice she has for you all, um, including the list of services that she has, you know, made use of during her time. So tutorial services, um, the McGill Writing Center, as well as the Office for Students with Disabilities. So those are the main ones that she highlights, and we're going to go over those. So Firstly, the McGill Writing Center can help you, it's completely free service to all McGill students, can help you formulate everything from the start of an essay all the way through the end, you know, final edits. They can help you at any point along the way. Um, you know, they can help you um, review, come up with ideas, make sure you've, you know, cited your bibliography is correct, all that stuff. Um, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session and get some help. Um, she also mentions the Office for Students with Disabilities, where you can meet with an access service advisor, find out about academic accommodations that may be available to you, um, as well as a vast bank of learning resources as well. Um, as a part of the Office for Students with Disabilities, there's also tutorial service. So this is a great tip. You know, new students get one hour of free tutoring. So make sure you take access of that. Um, this is much cheaper than you know if you were trying to find a tutor yourself off campus and all the tutors have been vetted by McGill so you know you're getting a good quality tutor. Um, there's also peer tutoring available from different student associations um, and again all very well vetted and McGill affiliated so you're guaranteed to get someone good. 
also um, Sam mentioned peer networks. So for example, um, if you're looking to connect with your peers, you know, we have uh, lots of peer programs through the Students Helping Students website and the Peer Support Center. Um, we have active listeners, non-judgmental. They offer one-on-one -on -one services. Uh, so if you're feeling a little bit down, you just want to talk to someone, the Peer Support Center um, is a great one for you to um, access. Uh, lastly, we're going to talk about Kirsten. So Kirsten is a Bachelor of Arts student in her U3 year. So uh, some specific, you know, McGill programs or resources that she highlights are the Art Hive, um, the Fitness Center, um, which as a part of that she has McGill's Yoga Club um, highlighted, the McGill Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, as well as community for any commuter students. So if you're planning on living off campus. Um, so firstly, she talks about the Art Hive. So the Art Hive is a part of the Student Wellness Hub, which is a one-stop shop for all health and wellness related activities at McGill. So as a part of the Wellness Hub, um, you can find the health promotion team, counselors, clinicians, as well as local wellness advisors who are located in the uh, student affairs offices. Um, they are all trained, to, and cl uh, trained clinicians who can help you throughout your time here at McGill. Now, Campus Life and Engagement also offers um, commuter student support through programs like Community, which is the Communities of McGill, a program offered by um, the Office of Upper Year Commuter Students, uh, but new students are also very welcome to join. There is the Juniors, Junior Connectors Program, which is a great opportunity for first year students specifically to get involved. Um, in August, there will be a specific orientation for first year commuter students called Off Campus Connects. So be sure to check that out if you plan on living off campus. Um, Kirsten also mentions the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, as well as the Fitness Center, which is um, offered by the Department of Athletics and Recreation. So if you're looking, if you like to go to the gym, or there's also an indoor track, there's a pool. They also offer lots of classes. I know Kirsten mentioned yoga, but they have like kickboxing, they have dance classes, they have all sorts. Um, there's squash courts. I think also there's a gym where you can play um, basketball. They also have intramural programs. Um, so lots there if you're into um, sort of sports, fitness, that kind of thing. So lastly, uh, you know, I am also a McGill graduate. I graduated about two years ago. And the advice that I want to give to you all is to um, please take advantage of campus life and engagement resources. So we are definitely here to support you. Please know that there is a place here at McGill for each and every one of you. Um, be sure to access our services and resources. You know, take advantage of those things that are there uh, to help make you help make you comfortable at McGill and to help you make the most of your time at McGill as well. Oh, so like I mentioned, lots of first year support resources. Um, this is sort of just a quick overview. Again, I'm not gonna go through each of these in detail, but we have our PowerPoint available for you if you wanna refer back to this. Um, but um, just to go over a few briefly, so McGill 101 is an online orientation which all first year students should have access to now. The pre-arrival webinars are also happening. All of this you can find on Campus Life and Engagement's website. So if you're interested in any of these resources, please visit our website and um, it'll link you all out there. And Speaking of our website, these are all of the resources and links that I mentioned throughout the presentation. So I've compiled them all here for you. Um, like I said, this presentation is available in the handout section, so you can pull that up and then click on any links that um, you are interested in visiting and, and learning more about. So thank you so much for listening to me blab on for the past you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, just remember that if you need anything uh, during your first year, um, during orientation week, or even now, please, please reach out to Campus Life and Engagement. We have a dedicated team of frontline support staff that can answer any questions that you have um, regarding your time at McGill and, for, and while you prepare to come here. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Caitlin. That was wonderful. And I think, as Caitlin mentioned, there's um, so many support services at McGill and people that are ready to help with this transition to university. Uh, but you have to keep in mind, we are a big institution. And so a lot of the time, it's just finding those resources, knowing how to navigate sort of the McGill world uh, and reaching out. So I think a message that we can share with all of you, recognizing that 
each of you is um, going through something different, whether it's figuring out how to register, figuring out travel plans to Canada. There's just so many things that you have to, to keep in mind that they, we do have an extensive support system here, um, but reach out, ask questions. But also, we are a research institution, so there's a lot of research that you can also do on your side. So using those links we've been sharing, reading through the website, I know it's a lot of content, but it definitely has a lot of very important information for you. So this, again, is part of a journey, getting some of the information today and then taking it with you uh, to do some further reading and exploration. So now we're going to move on to the next part of our event, which is our really interactive dialogue Q&A with our panelists. And again, just wanted to remind you that in the GoToWebinar um, platform, you should see the chat box. So if you do want to ask a specific question, feel free to type it in there and we'll either answer it typed um, uh, on behind the scenes or we'll be answering it verbally uh, when it's a common question. And again, the handouts. Uh, we recognize again lots of information coming to you. So there are three different handouts uh, related to campus life engagement and all the activities coming up and the links that Caitlin shared uh, and details for International Student Services and our agenda. So feel free to download uh, those PDFs. So let's meet our panelists. And so we're going to turn it over. And uh, if we were going to ask everyone, kind of just introduce themselves, uh, talk a little bit about their McGill affiliation, uh, but also for our student perspective, what you're currently studying, how you um, kind of studied last year, particularly, um, and any other fun details related to your housing in Montreal, clubs you've joined, and all of that fun stuff. Um, so let's turn it over to Sasha first. And Sasha, uh, feel free to share a little bit about you. And thank you for joining our panel today. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Sasha. I am entering my third year at McGill. I'm originally from Paris, France. And um, this year, I actually have the pleasure of serving as your SMU VP external. So what that means is that I, the Student Society of McGill University represents every undergraduate student, and I am one of its executives, which means I will have the pleasure of serving you um, because you are automatically a member of SMU. And um, as the executives, we kind of uh, run the student side of McGill, uh, whether it's clubs, certain services, or even relations with the university uh, defending student rights. Personally, I'm a faculty of art student. Uh, I study political science and international development. I spent the last year here in Montreal. I am very much still here in Montreal. Um, and uh, I studied only online, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, habits of going outside and taking daily walks help out. And I am excited for the return in person uh, in the fall. Uh, and I have had the opportunity to go back on campus a couple of times uh, because of my job as VP external and honestly it's been great that, to see the campus getting ready for everything. Great, thank you so much Asha. All right, let's turn it over to Louisa and Catherine. Hi, so I'm Louisa. I'm also entering my third year at McGill and I'm studying political science and English literature. Um, so the past year I was also in Montreal um, just because even though school was online for me, it meant a lot to be in the, like kind of the same city as the school in which I'm studying. So I felt like that was kind of made me feel more connected to McGill, even though McGill is still online. Um, and in terms of extracurriculars, I am currently the vice president of events for the McGill Pre-Law Student Society and um, vice president of external affairs for Her Campus McGill, which is like a women's magazine. They have chapters around the world and stuff. So also if you guys want to get involved in either of those clubs, please come check us out in September. We're going to be running loads of events, um, especially if you're interested in law, the pre-law student society should be um, awesome for that. So yeah. And I'm Catherine, I'm Louise's mother, and I am a McGill alumni. I actually have three degrees from McGill. I did my undergraduate and I did my law degrees there as well. I'm Canadian, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, which is different than my daughter's because she was raised here in the UK, which is where we're, we're coming to you live. Um, but I'm originally a Montrealer, in fact, and um, yeah, I have been in the UK for, for 20 years now. And very happy to answer any questions that any parents have, or I mean, students are more likely, I think, to answer, to ask questions of the students and parents are probably more likely to ask parent, uh, me as a parent the questions, but uh, over to you, over back, back to you ladies. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so both Sasha and Louisa mentioned about coming back to campus in September. And of course, hopefully you've been receiving a lot of information as new students and families um, that this is the plan. So just did want to reiterate as well is that the campus will be open um, September for start of class. And so the expectation is that students will be arriving in Montreal. And I think Louisa, you made a really good point that even just to be here in the same time zone, being connected with campus will be super important. So we're very excited um, that uh, you know campus will be um, back in action in September. So it does mean that uh, courses will be offered primarily in person or again, depending on the, the, the size of the course, it might be offered virtually, but not keep in mind it's not going to be hybrid. So if you're registering for your courses right now and you see it's an in-person class, uh, we definitely want you here in Montreal for that. Um, so maybe from Sasha and Louisa's side too, just sort of because again, you've registered for your courses for your, your coming year, what is it looking like for you from a student perspective, uh, what the fall will look like? Um, so Sasha, can we start with you and then we'll go to Louisa directly. Yeah, um, I'm just really excited to be back. Uh, I mean, Louisa mentioned that being in Montreal helped her stay connected to McGill and it was the exact same reason that I stayed here. Um, I've registered for my courses all in person um definitely uh actually as a as uh, a, a member of SMU I've had the opportunity to talk with the McGill administration about the measures that they're putting in place and it just seems like we're going to be able to have a smooth return on campus while maintaining student safety and I'm just really excited to be able to see my friends and walk in the halls and complain about the cold weather in winter <laughs> Oh, um, no, I just wanted to say uh, I'm also super excited to go back to campus. I think around half of my classes are online and half are in person, which should be kind of almost a nice transition. And I think for students who are entering McGill this year, um, it probably will also be a good transition because I know that a lot of high schools were online. So especially if you're going into university, it might be nice if a couple are online. Um, but that being said, I have missed in-person classes a lot, so I'm super excited um, for those to return. Um, and it's just the little things like studying in the library um, and like Sasha said, like being able to walk through the halls and get like dispatch coffee is a McGill favorite. It's in the McConnell Engineering <laughs> building. Yeah, but like all of those little things are just, <laughs> it's a lot to look forward to for you guys. That's fantastic. And I love these little tidbits. So throw them in any time for little bits of uh, advice and things when students arrive. Um, Louisa, maybe because you are looking to the fall with some of this in-person classes as well as um, a remote, any tips, and especially living through it again this past year, of just for those students, especially for our incoming students that will have potentially some classes uh, remote just because of the size of the class they might be in for some of those first year classes. Um, tips on how to stay connected and how to connect with professors and maybe teachers assistants how any advice on how you did that from the remote side of things yeah so for me i'm not sure i think i'm like i assume we're gonna have quite we have quite a diverse audience in terms of what people are studying but from someone who is studying in arts um forming i think kind of like ta student relationships is really important so like actually taking the time to reach out to your ta and say oh, you know, can you please uh, like let me know what extra tips I can, um, or can you please let me know some tips on how to better my essay, or can you please um, let me know why I got this grade instead of this one? That kind of thing, even though it takes like a little bit more effort and a little bit more time, in the end you'll be grateful because it will mean that, number one, you're, you're kind of staying close to the individuals who are actually teaching you at McGill, um, but also you're like bettering your learning experience because you're going to be able to keep improving. Um, so I think that's really important. But also um, like going to, yeah, just going to professors office hours and stuff like that um, can really make you feel like you're still, if you do, if your classes are primarily online, um, that will make you feel like, you know, you're still a student at McGill, you're connecting with your professors, that kind of thing. Um, and that's what I did quite a lot and it really helped me. Thank you so much. And along the same lines, and I'm going to turn this to Sasha and then Caitlin as well. 
obviously coming to campus now is exciting as we all are good looking forward to seeing everyone in person um, but mcgill is a big school as we said we're you know 40,000 plus students and staff so you know we're, we're our own town how does one navigate that especially if you have been working virtually for the past year it might feel overwhelming so sasha just on that side too of just how to kind of build your network at mcgill how to not feel like you're just a one person of the mass like when you go into class any again tips and tricks and ideas of how to um either engage in-person classes with your profs but then also to kind of get involved on campus and then caitlin from uh the clay side too some of those ways that students can get involved without feeling too overwhelmed so sasha on the in-person side any suggestions for sure. I mean, I definitely felt overwhelmed when I first moved in. I remember moving into uh, upper residences and seeing all those people and feeling like a very, very anonymous person. Um, honestly, I would just uh, add to start, not put too much pressure on it and trust that as you're settling in, you're going to meet people on your floor in residence, in your classes, or just as you're discovering the library and the cafes, you got to remember that every single first year student is in the same boat as you it's not you are not singled out it's every first year stu student is overwhelmed as for getting involved uh SMU organizes an activities night uh the september 13th and 14th where every pl 200 plus club is going to be present and therefore you're going to be able to register and honestly the best tip i can give you to meet people with whom you're going you're going to become friends is to join clubs because you know that these people will have the same interests as you whether it's a video game club a, a cultural club a food club it can be absolutely anything um i personally joined model un in my first year and that's how i made the majority of my friends um and i would just honestly enjoy also because you're all international students life in montreal right you're independent uh you get access to a town which is super student friendly but also downtown you, you'll see is very influenced by mcgill and the mcgill community and that's on that's honestly great because anywhere you go you'll once you feel more at home at mcgill you'll feel at home a little bit everywhere Perfect. And you said a really good word there about independence. So we're going to come back to that in a second, because I think it's a big feature of being a McGillian. Um, Caitlin, over to you too, just in terms of, again, that arrival on campus, and maybe if you could throw in a little bit about what um, the orientation will look like in terms of starting that network as well. Yeah. So, I mean, my advice for was, honestly, I don't really know what to say because Sasha took verbatim what I was going to say about getting involved being the best way. I mean, but that just goes to show you that it really is solid advice. Um, in terms of orientation, um, there will be lots of opportunity to meet people um, there. Orientation will be largely online with the exception of brush activities, which will be um, a bit of a hybrid. Um, this is just as a result of um, ongoing, you know, COVID regulations and restrictions. Um, but orientation last year, you know, we worked really hard to um, make it a place where people could still connect despite the virtual nature. And, uh, you know, we've only improved on it since then. Um, there will be specific um, programming for students who will be living off campus, as well as students who will be living on residences, where you can meet people um, who will be in sort of the, in the same situation as you. Um, Sasha mentioned activities night. There will also be a services fair during orientation, which is very similar to activities night, um, but will have a bit of a wider scope. So if you're looking to get involved on campus, I highly, highly recommend attending that. Um, obviously, clubs and are a great way to meet people with similar interests. You can also join intramurals if you're interested in um, playing in teams or any sport. Um, there's lots of options for that. There's also, as I mentioned during my presentation, undergraduate societies. Every single department and, or department and faculty has one. There's also they also have to often sorry, they also often have first year councils specifically for first year students to get involved. So if that's more your speed as opposed to a club, um, that is a great way to immediately get involved. And like I, like Sasha said, the, the reason that getting involved works in terms of making connections is because you already have a core interest in common. So it's really easy to make friends that way and find like a network and community. Uh, so yeah. 
Perfect, thank you. And just to confirm uh, the activities night you mentioned, Sasha, um, is, that, is that going to be in person as well or will that be at a, a virtual activities night? As of right now, we're planning it to be in person, uh, holding it in the gym like every year. If there are any developments, you will find out at the same time as I will. <laughs> Perfect. And that's it. And that actually reminds us to remind you as well. So much communication that comes from McGill will be through your McGill address. So since you've confirmed your offers, you've registered for courses, um, we have all of our student services and faculties sharing a lot of information like this with you in your McGill email address. So super important to follow that email address um, because as we see, um, there's news updates and changes uh, on the daily. So always good to track that. So let's go a little bit over to the parent side perspective now. Um, Sasha, you mentioned that word independence and I said I'd come back to it because when you come to McGill, it, there's definitely this sort of uh, sense that we're obviously treating our students um, as adults. And so there's that idea of having sort of a, a proactive nature maybe and really kind of um, putting yourself out there in terms of asking questions and doing research and such. Um, but we also know the parents play a huge role in family support network. Um, so Catherine, just from your side, thinking back to when Louisa started McGill, are there any um, bits of advice you can offer our families and support networks in terms of just helping um, navigate that transition to university and any, again, specific tips on whether it's bank accounts and fees and cell phones and all of that um, just to help yeah. with that transition. Yeah, I mean, a couple couple sort of random thoughts. One is just you mentioned cell phones and I, you know, I know this is an international audience, but people will be gobsmacked, as we say in the UK, to find out how much more expensive cell phones are in Canada than they are anywhere else in the world. But once you get used to the sticker shock, there are, you know, it's, it's you know, there's the standard offering and it's it's fine and it's kind of a, it's it's now, you know, a fact of life, like heating in Canada, a cell phone for a teenager or anybody I think is, is important. But um, the other thing, which I think being a sort of a type A person, I found really helpful. And I um, mentioned this before to, to I think on a, on a previous year's panel, um, just to be very prepared for the student, you will work with your child to get very prepared to go to McGill. And that I, I even have a list, which I'm happy to share with anybody who, who wants, uh, who wants it, which is, very granular and says everything from you know how to make extra storage on uh this the dorm beds by adding these bed risers and where you can get them to you know the the, the various things you need like maybe a lock a lock box for the for their their dorm room if they want to keep to put to you know put away valuables etc and there was something i think quite satisfying because it's quite a nerve-wracking thing to be sending your child away to another country to a bit to having something so you know, specific with all the stuff that you could they could possibly need to to take care of themselves. The rest of it is psychological. Is just saying, you know, I'm letting my my child go forward into the into the world, and they'll be fine because they're you, you've raised good kids and they're bright. And there's also a lot of support at McGill. So, you know, even if you know I couldn't be there without a flight, I knew that if something did happen, medical or emotional or whatever, there was there's so much support um, at McGill that you know, I really felt I was leaving her in safe hands. That's great to hear. Thank you so much, Catherine. And maybe just a little along those lines of just helping with the logistic piece. Um, in terms of, and this is something for all families to know, is that uh, with your, and I mentioned knowing your McGill email address, the other piece of McGill you're going to be fondly connect with is Minerva. Minerva is your other kind of gateway to McGill to know everything that's happening. So your obviously your course registration, but also the student account side of things. So we do have some questions coming in just about tuition, how it's paid, when it's paid, and what do families have access to? So maybe Catherine on your side, um, did you have access or do you have access to Louisa's student account piece? Not her transcripts and nothing academic, but how, and how do you pay it from overseas, like student uh, tuition and yeah. things like that? Well, I'm lucky, I mean, first of all, I don't. I wouldn't say we're not the poster child of it, because I think we, um, Louisa thought I was getting her Minerva, her, her tuition bills, and I did, so, we, we we sorted it out, but I actually yeah, like, but, but I, I actually do have a still a Canadian bank account, so I just pay directly from there. But you can, I'm sure, pay from any bank. I mean, it's now quite easy to pay internationally. I don't know, actually, maybe even Sasha knows how that. Do you, do you are you able to answer that one because you 
sound like you have a Parisian connection. Yes. Um, well, there are several ways. Uh, McGill offers a way to transfer money international, uh, in, in, internationally. But if you don't want to pay the fees or it's too complicated or it takes too long, uh, I know that I gave my parents access to uh, my student's account. And whenever they see the amount, they use a, a service called TransferWise, which transfers money without the fee uh, within a couple of business days. Um, well, at least with a much lower fee internationally so they just send money to my personal canadian account and i pay from there oh super helpful see i learn something new every day with these panels yeah. as well I wish you to Sasha a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Sasha. so you called it transfer wise right and you had to yeah. give your parents access uh to your minerva student account to be able to do that yep Correct. perfect caitlin do you have any information on sort of the time frame of when tuition needs to be paid, but also on the housing side, because you also were a member of our, our housing unit a long time ago. Um, not so yes. long, but the, the details of sort of that fee part of it. Yeah, so tuition is billed twice a year. So at the start of the semester, tuition will be due. The tuition for fall 2021 is due August 31st. Um, the tuition for the winter semester, I believe, is due January 5th, but don't quote me on that. It's the beginning of January. Um, the e-bill will be released at the beginning of the month so they don't give an exact date but it's within the first few days of the month um, it'll be released on minerva students will also get an email to their mcgill email notifying them that the bill is ready uh, it's due at the end of the month there will be a bill released monthly but you won't necessarily have um, fees like on each bill um, so definitely the tuition bills um, will be released. So August, you can expect the fall tuition bill. December, you can expect the winter tuition bill. And then if you're a resident student, um, residents like rent gets billed monthly. So there will be, I believe September's rent is included in the August bill. Um, so it's like one month ahead. And then meal plan for residences gets billed twice a year. So that will be billed with tuition. So half of the meal plan money will be billed in August, due August 31st, and the other half will be billed in December, due at the beginning of January. I don't know the date off the top of my head, um, but yeah. And things like if you do printing on campus um, with your McGill card, you print, that's all included on your monthly McGill bill. So it's, it's very convenient that way. Perfect. And so rule of thumb or guideline, because it is a lot of dates and different money being assessed at different times, is to monitor that Minerva student account bill. Uh, would everyone suggest that as the, the way to keep it organized? Every month, because otherwise then it will, then I think like if you don't pay it, you know, you've got charge and just pay and, every and, month. Yeah. And top tip is if it, the arrangement is that the parent is going to be paying for it, send them the bill so they know that they have to pay for it. Just a, yeah. just a tip. <laughs> um, last question, just on the um, student account side of things, I guess, or just finance side, uh, is about that idea of having a bank account uh, set up in Montreal. So maybe Catherine and Louisa was more of, easier to facilitate because you'd already set it up. But Sasha, by chance, did, did you end up setting up a bank account in Montreal or um, is everything kind of transferred if you need to from back home? Uh, yeah, I do have a bank account in in, in Montreal. I opened uh, an account with with Scotia Bank, which I would recommend because um, it, I know it doesn't work the same internationally as it does in Canada. But um, you have a certain number of credit or debit card transactions allowed every month, or otherwise you are charged extra. And I made that mistake. Uh, but uh, Scotia Bank offers a student deal where. Um, you don't have a limited uh, amount of transactions, so you can pay everything by debit or credit card. And as well, uh, anytime you pay something, you get points to get free movie tickets. So I recommend I went to the movies for, for the first time in a year and a half last week. It was great. Huh. <laughs> and actually, just on that, my my um, my bank account was separate. So Louisa had to like yeah, Sasha go up my set up her own and that was pretty straightforward but like yeah. Sasha she you went with Scotia as uh, well, well right? I started this is the thing so I started off with CIBC and I didn't even like I, I I was getting charged every month and so I only recently like maybe in like if March of my second year set up a Scotia Bank account because all my roommates had it and they were like why are you not with Scotia Bank because you wouldn't be charged and it was the best choice ever because now I'm <laughs> not no longer charged for the transactions I make and stuff like that so definitely go with the Scotia Bank one. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. That's such a great takeaway and a great tip. Um, Caitlin, a uh, question is coming in about, so before we forget about frost, um, is there a way for registration for orientation and frost? Can you just reiterate how that's going to happen and unfold over the summer? For sure. So um, I just want to also clarify the difference between when we say frost and orientation. Mm, so <laughs> um, orientation week is like the, from, it's, it's going to start August 23rd and it, it honestly will go until August 31st. Um, there will not be activities like mandatory activities every day. Um, there's different activities for different students, different groups of students throughout the week. So some orientation activities are just for all McGill students. And they're like university orientation activities, including like faculty orientation, where you'll meet with representatives from your faculties, like your academic advisors, the deans, that sort of thing, to give you an introduction that is faculty specific. We have the services fair where all McGill clubs, services, teams, organizations will be tabling. Um, and then there's also frosh. So frosh is like, you know, what you think of as like typical, you know, in the movies, orientation, you know, um, it's more social rather than like, uh, we're here to like tell you, you know, what academic integrity is kind of things. Um, so frosh will be happening for a portion of orientation week and the university coordinates with all the froshes so there's not there shouldn't be like competing activities the university activities happen on separate days from the frosh to allow students to attend both um, registration for all of orientation week will be going live sometime at the beginning of august we don't have an exact date yet um, but they, all students will receive an email from us at campus life and engagement they should have already been receiving emails from us weekly um, so it's this, this, those same emails. We'll be sending you one when frost register or when orientation registration is live, inviting you to sign up for all of the or, um, orientation events, including frost. So yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, again, it's probably a check your emails, everyone, and the the website yeah. will the be updated. August, it'll be on all our social medias as well in the McGill Entering Class community. There's an Entering Class Discord um, email. Facebook, you know, any it's, it'll be all over. You you won't miss it. Perfect, thank you. All right, we're coming up to almost 10 minutes left. And if there's some more questions coming in, if the panelists are able to stay a little bit longer after, um, so we will continue to answer questions. But some of the ones that came in before, um, obviously were related to even just arriving in Canada and especially as an international student requiring to have the proper immigration documents to study in Canada. Um, lots of questions there. I'll try and answer it very quickly in that we are not immigration advisors, unfortunately, on this panel today, so we can't offer immigration advice. Uh, what we can share with you, of course, is that in order to study full time in Canada, you do need your CAQ or the Certificate of Acceptance to study in Quebec. So that's our provincial requirement. And in addition, um, our study permit to study in Canada. So through our International Student Service uh, website. You have a lots and lots of details about immigration. And also coming up next week, so we're going to put these links in the chat, is there will be a town hall uh, for international students to really kind of navigate that process of arriving in Canada. Um, as we see again on the daily, uh, things are changing uh, there in terms of arriving in Canada and the protocols and requirements. Um, so we'll also put in the chat a bunch of Canadian um, immigration resources that you can refer to because again this is an overarching um, like requirements that our government are putting in so whether it is needing to quarantine uh, when you get in whether you have the, uh, you're fully vaccinated and have one of the vaccines that Canada's recognizing it means you might not have to quarantine so it really depends on your circumstances where you're f traveling in from um, and so there's some very fine details that you're going to want to research so please use the the Canadian government websites that we're putting in uh, to the chat as well as if you want to sign up for that international student town hall uh, that's coming up on July 29th I think that would be a very important step and also with our own website, everything related to COVID um, in terms of guidelines and protocols are on our website as well. So again, we'll obviously communicate with you, uh, but for some of those very important and uh, logistical details, it's good to uh, follow up with all the authorities. But kind of on the lighter side, I guess, um, we do have some questions just about that transition uh, coming back again to university. So um, Catherine, maybe we'll throw it back over to you as well. And I'm just gonna pull up the question here. 
Um, the actual, we have a question actually coming in just from traveling from the UK to McGill and sort of starting that process. So maybe from the parent side and Louisa side, um, what was the experience like? Just even like the arrival piece and getting set up in Montreal. Uh, maybe we'll start there, but then also Sasha from your side too, how that was like as a first year student. For, for us, it was, I mean, it was pre-pandemic. And now when I look back, you know, it was just a breeze. You know, we, we had lots of bags. To, and actually, I think we had purchased very lightweight duffel bags so that we could stuff in as much stuff as possible. And I think, I don't even think we ended up having to pay, you know, extra luggage charges. Yeah. We, we managed with that. And we arrived in, um, my, my husband and I uh, took Louise, we, we flew Louise in, which, you know, I think some parents do, some parents don't. There's pretty pretty split I think but we did it because it was good for us to go back to Montreal anyway and we um you know just sort of helped to set her set her up at, yeah. at at residence um and then I think we stayed an extra three days which you know was nice for us but you know she at that point she was quite involved with um <laughs> Frosh and you know we didn't we didn't see much of her so I, I don't I mean it was it was just nice for us to be there but um, yeah, that was it, it. Was all really quite smooth. The, the whole set, getting her into residence, and you know, it's all it's it's furnished. So there's just sort of extra bits and bobs that you need, as as I mentioned. So I mean, was was that your experience as well? Yeah, like I, I'm actually. I just want to verify. Upper Res is open this year. Yeah. So I was in Upper Res, and personally, um, I feel like just be that it, it is generally like a very social residence. So that made the transition a lot easier. For me personally, like my floor fellow was amazing. She organized like weekly tea times with like all of our floor. And that automatically just makes you feel like you have a community on your floor and like you already have people you know and can connect with on your floor. So that definitely helped with the transition. Um, also in terms of being like transitioning from the UK specifically, I had an international buddy. So I was also an international buddy myself in second year, but like I was a, I don't know like I wasn't the one organizing it in the first year I was just the one receiving the buddy's help so to speak um and so that was nice like my buddy gave me loads of tips on my places to go in Montreal and like he actually also I think he was in a frat and he invited me and my friends to like his party and we were so excited because like we were British <laughs> and we'd never been to a frat party because like you know it's not a thing in Britain America, so we felt like American. we were living our best life we were like <laughs> we're in a movie like this is amazing so <laughs> that was fun but yeah I would say definitely get a buddy because you can um, just in terms of like getting an insider scoop from what's it like to be in Montreal, what's it like to be an international student in Montreal, and to feel like you already know someone that can be really helpful. Perfect, yeah. thank you. And uh, before Sasha goes in, I just want to come back to Catherine for one moment because you did mention that you stayed in Montreal for three days. So again, with the pandemic, it's a little bit different for travelers coming in um, if you're trying to travel in uh, with students starting. So again, you have to check the Canadian guidelines, but let's say student or a family member is able to travel in. Obviously a student is moving into residences potentially. Um, and so families are not accommodated in residences. Again, just kind of putting the, painting the picture of Montreal in terms of, you know, accessibility to stay in different places and even just shopping. Like if you're bringing the limited things you can to travel, how, you know, accessible is Montreal to obtain things that a student might need? So just from that side of things, Catherine, how did you handle that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, McGill is so centrally located that it's, uh, upper residence has a little bit of a walk up there, but it's still, it's, it's you know, you're not more than sort of a 15 or 20 minute walk from anything. But when we stayed in Montreal, even though I had family to stay with, we decided because we wanted to be closer to Louisa, we um, stayed in a hotel. And actually, one other top tip is somewhere on the McGill website, you can get really quite substantial discounts if you are a McGill um, parent. I think it's like 20 or 25 percent off the rack rates at a hotel, which is, you know, it, it, it's really worth doing. So we actually stayed downtown and that way we could sort of lug stuff up to her her residence when uh, when she when she wasn't busy on a frosh uh, activity <laughs> um, and and uh, you know there's shopping you know there's department stores the bay etc everything you could possibly need in in the downtown core so we had a car so we actually went out to IKEA once but you could absolutely just come into Montreal stay downtown and p help pick up the bits and bobs that that are that are required without without needing a car if um it, it, if that if that's not as convenient for people 
Perfect and important to you. Cars possibly not needed, and especially with deliveries these days from yeah. Amazon, Walmart, wherever you need, a lot of it can be delivered um, to your residences. So back to you, Sasha. Sorry, just about your um, experience as well. Yeah, um, definitely. As Catherine and Louisa mentioned, lots of bags. Um, my parents um, flew me in. Uh, we all had checked bags, but I filled those up with my stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, what we did is uh, we came three days early, which allowed us to, you know, just set up insurance, bank account, phone, etc. Um, my parents also did stay a couple of days. Did not see them much over those couple of days. Um, <laughs> I should have did Gosh, activities. Okay. Um, but um, it was quite easy to set up. Well, definitely. Re like recommend is know your move-in dates. It might change depending on the initial of your last name. Uh, because obviously a lot of people move, move in um, and just like come prepared with a checklist of things to, to do. I need to buy bed sheets. I need to set up my bank account. I need to do this and whatnot and uh, and kind of figure out where, where things are. But again, everything is downtown. Um, and I, I thought I'd mention um, McGill does have a uh, COVID bursary. So if things are expensive to travel over to Montreal, which I know is a concern I've been uh, hearing a lot about, um, or if it's expensive to get an Airbnb or a hotel to say because you're accompanying your child or you came a couple days earlier, um, there is definitely the option to apply for that bursary and get a little bit of money and a little bit of help, uh, wh whether it's to pay rent or just for those couple of days. Excellent. And for that information, um, just to look at the scholarships and student aid website and contact our student aid website. And Caitlin, this is probably perfect because I was going to turn it over to you as well. Um, in terms of some of those, like you're probably going to mention something um, and then also like the lists and ideas of that, you know, checklist that I know uh, Campus Life and Engagement puts together. So some of those resources. Yeah, I just before I talk about that, I actually had a few comments that about say some stuff that came up. So definitely, you know, parents if you're coming to accompany your kids once move-in starts august 23rd you know yeah definitely the experience is that you will not see them that much they are kept busy that week you know prior to school um so because i know also some parents have concerns like oh well, my child you know they're new to the city they they don't know anyone maybe they even in sometimes a language barrier will they just be on their own for a whole week before classes start and the answer is no we there's a lot of activities um, especially if they live in residences there's like stuff planned to occupy students and help introduce them to the McGill community they're not just like left on their own you know completely um, the second thing I wanted to mention was that sometimes residences will actually let you send packages there prior to move in um, this is like dependent on the residents, but you can contact them. You can contact housing about this. Um, maybe it might be a little different because of COVID this year, but generally they will let you send packages um, if you're like ordering stuff like sheets or extra pillows, I don't know, um, and they will hold them for you until move in and then you can pick them up. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was move-in dates this year are have been extended because of COVID. So and you know international students arriving maybe a little bit later. Um, so usually move-in is like a weekend. This year it's going to be a, a week. Um, so it'll go from I think the start is August 22nd. Let me just look at my calendar. August 21st till the 29th. Um, so there's that as well. And then you asked me about packing lists. Um, yes, there is one on the Campus Life and Engagement website. Um, and there's also one on the McGill Incoming slash New Students website, um, a list of uh, things like dorm essentials, as well as just like McGill essentials to pack um, when you're coming to McGill. And this is also useful for um, domestic students as well, not just international students. Perfect. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And that's really important information. And you did mention the move-in uh, dates. Uh, so as mentioned, it's going to be for a week starting August 21st. And of course, students, especially international travelers, maybe that doesn't align exactly with when you need to travel, either before or after. So if you do have any questions about uh, residences themselves and the move-in dates or you need some potential uh, different accommodation, definitely reach out to housing um, and they will sort of navigate that with you as well. So they're there for you. Um, we're going to do a few just rapid round questions. Uh, we're 
past the hour already, but I'm hoping my panelists, could we stay on for another five to 10 minutes just to finalize some questions? Is that sure. okay? And for, oh, thank you. And for our, our attendees as well, we're, we're pretty much wrapping up the final questions. If you had any last minute things you wanted to pose, uh, put it in the chat um, and we'll try to cover as much as we can. Very quickly, I'll go through. Um, and there was a question about vaccinations. Are you is McGill requiring students to be vaccinated? Uh, and we are not. Again, we follow government guidelines and things. Obviously, highly encourage students to do that. Um, but if you aren't vaccinated, rest assured that when you get to Canada as a student and as part of your health plan, uh, that is an international student you're part of, the Blue Cross Health Insurance Plan, you can get vaccinated uh, when you do arrive in Quebec. So not to worry about that, that if it's not done uh, in your country or you potentially have a vaccine um, that Canada is not recognizing right now, uh, it can be done um, in Quebec when you're here. And the quarantine process, again, as I mentioned earlier, just because there was another question, um, again, it really will depend on your circumstances. So following McGill's website, as well as the Canadian government guidelines uh, would be very important. Um, from my side, um, because I work in enrollment services, um, just want to mention that, and Caitlin just mentioned it as well, that we have an accepted student website. And so we'll put that in the chat, um, but it's mcgill.ca slash accepted. If you go into that tool kind of bar at the top, you will see a, a tab that says next steps. Part of your next steps will be to provide your final proof of graduation and final transcript. How we get that will depend on your curriculum and country. Uh, so again, look at that website, look at that table. Um, sometimes it'll be your school potentially emailing us a document or sending it through parchment. Other times, if you're international baccalaureate, it will come through the organization, again, depending on the curriculum. So make sure we do receive those final documents because that has to complete your file. In addition, if you are wanting to, you'll need to show us your, like your legal documents. So for example, um, having Canadian status, you will want to provide proof of that status. If you're a French citizen and you're looking for the tuition subsidy, again, you will need to provide these documents to us. So another important step is to go to mcgill.ca slash next steps slash legal documents. All of that information is there, but those are some of those little, um, technical pieces, they're very important pieces uh, that you need to wrap up. That was my side. So make sure you send us those documents. Very important to reach out on the accepted student site for those details. Um, I'm gonna flip it back now uh, to our panelists. Um, some questions about actually finding jobs on campus. So to start off with Canadian students, of course, but international students as well, you are uh, eligible for a work permit. Um, maybe I know, just we can by raise of hands. Does anyone want to talk about finding a job on campus and any ideas and recommendations? Louisa, sure, go ahead. Um, it's not specifically about on campus, but in time, I know that most people would try to find jobs on campus if they're trying to find an English speaking job. So I can give some type of advice because I work as a teacher in Montreal. But there's a Montreal-based tutoring company that called Paper, which is very keen to accept McGill students. The founder and CEO is a McGill student, and they love McGill students. And a lot of my friends, like one of my roommates, my boyfriend, his friends are all like tutors for this company. And they accept French and English speaking students, and I think other languages as well. It's online tutoring. But you know it's above minimum wage pay it's pretty good for a resume so just like check that out like just papers and sheet of paper but look up yeah and adding on to that um i know that yes as students were eligible for work fees as well but um our study permit does allow us for up to 20 hours of work uh a, a week no no matter what and um and mcgill offers a sorry i have a puppy at home <laughs> Um, Bill uh, uh, offers a work study program which will help place you in jobs on campus, whether it's front desk in residences, barista at uh, on campus, coffee lo locations, and whatnot. Perfect. Maybe Caitlin, can you just talk? Oh, oh go ahead, Sasha. Did yeah, you want to I mention something? Really forgot to mention. I'm so sorry. Um, and also, there are a couple of student government jobs that are paid. Uh, for example, if you are a counselor to the Smooth Legislative Council. Uh, you get paid as an executive of the SMU, uh, I get a salary, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely looking into that if you're 
like me, a student government nerd, um, you should look into it because they're nice. And what about you, Caitlin? Maybe if you could just mention um, some of the resources if a student is looking for a job, some of the resources they can um, look at, at on McGill's campus. Yeah, so um, just to first touch on the difference between work study and other jobs. So work study is a program with um, the scholarships of student aid office where students who have sort of demonstrated financial need can apply to the program and they get priority access to on-campus jobs. So um, just through that program. So if, if you feel that you would qualify, I highly recommend applying. Even if you're unsure, apply anyway. Worst case, you get rejected, no big deal. Um, other places to find jobs um, is in uh, listservs. Listservs are like, we, I don't know if that's McGill's specific lingo or um, if that's like a common thing, but anyway, email newsletters basically. You'll get them from your faculty associations, from your student associations, um, you know, from housing. And a lot of the times, if, if there are any job openings in those departments, they will be included in the listserv. So I would always recommend checking your email thoroughly. CAPS also has the My Future um, portal, which doesn't have a ton of part-time jobs, but there are some. And I, they can also connect you to, um, you know, common um, employers in the Montreal community, like um, Louisa was mentioning with um, the tutoring company that she worked for. And um, yeah, so I think those are the, the main ones um, that, I, that I can think of. Perfect, thank you. And oh, for also, applying- actually, sorry. Oh. Also, sorry, this may not ahead, be super applicable in first year, but once you get to your second, third year, um, if you're interested in doing research with a prof and their team, those can also sometimes be paid positions as well. Um, so, you know, buddy up to your profs if you're interested in the work that they're doing, um, because sometimes they will accept student staff. Fantastic. And Caitlin, when you mentioned applying for work study, if we navigate towards the scholarships and financial aid uh, website, I think students can find information on how to apply for a work study position. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. And the application is open right now. So they can apply before coming to campus. Perfect. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Okay. A few last questions. Advice, and I mentioned before that international students are eligible or will be opting into the Blue Cross health insurance plan. So it gives you access to health and dental while you're in, um, while you're on campus. Can anyone speak to the health services uh, that are available and any advice if a student needs to get a prescription renewed or um, in case, you know, you need to you think you have the flu and you need to go check in with a doctor. Any advice on navigating our health system? I, I, I'm, I'm, I have Quebec healthcare because I'm a Canadian. But for sure you didn't. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know if I'm the best to speak to. I, I mean, I used it, uh, the health services a little, but not that much. But I don't know if Sasha maybe can. Yeah, um, as a French person, if there are any French attendees, you're actually eligible for Quebec healthcare as well, uh, which saves you uh, a, a little bit of money on Blue Cross. But I have used McGill services quite a bit. So um, I will say a couple of things. Um, first of all, everything is at the Student Wellness Hub. Um, the Student Wellness Hub offers a wide array of uh, medical services, whether it's SED tests, therapists, or just, you know, like Jen mentioned, the flu. Um, prescriptions work a little differently here. It's such a cool system. I don't know why it's not like this in France. In France, you get your prescription from your doctor, you go to the pharmacy, here your doctor just sends it to the pharmacy, you call your pharmacy up and they have the prescription ready when, when you go revolutionary uh so that simplifies things um the hub is accessible um but it is true that to get in you will have to spend a little bit of time waiting on the phone or uh maybe in line but i know that mikhail is investing more to bolster these services and finally something i will definitely recommend which technically doesn't fall as a service of the hub are local wellness advisors. So they work in tandem with your academic advisors. Um, and local wellness advisors are mental health licensed professionals, but not doctors who are just here to advise you. And being part of the McGill community, they can advise you specifically regarding McGill services. So I personally see a local wellness advisor and she was able to direct me uh, towards where to get the proper support. And 
um, whether it's because you need therapy or just someone to chat to about life, about it's overwhelming to move in. Local wellness advisors are really helpful and you can book sessions right now online uh, through the faculty website, I believe. Thank you for that. That is such a, I mean, a great piece of advice. And I think one thing we can share with all of you is that everyone is going to be going through something very different and new uh, starting in September, even for our current students coming back. And obviously as new students, it is a huge transition. And don't be shy. Don't feel afraid like you're the only one going through something. So reaching out to these experts and support network will be super, super important. So um, definitely take the time to um, take care of yourself and ask as many questions as you can. Um, we even have questions coming in even just about faculty circumstances. What if I'm not happy in my faculty or I'm not happy in the program I'm in? How do I navigate maybe changing? Um, that could be complicated, but really seek advice from your advisors in your faculty. And again, talk to other students, talk to upper year students, um, because you definitely have a lot of expertise around you that can help, you, uh, help support you through those uh, transitions. So we're gonna wrap up. We've already about 15 minutes behind schedule, but I think we had so many amazing questions come in and so much great advice um, that is, I think hopefully um, you've enjoyed staying with us a bit longer. Um, but as we wrap up, I'm gonna throw it back to our panelists um, for two things. One is, again, if you think back to as a student starting at McGill, that first year experience, if you could give advice to your former self or as a staff member or parent, um, any advice you can give our attendees, again, to help with that transition. So words of wisdom, tips, any other advice we haven't talked about yet, and also something they might need. If you think you're moving into residence, this is the one item you know you have needed to have, or when you're learning at McGill, something tangible to bring um, with you, or not tangible, but an item and then a word of advice. So. Um, Let's go with Caitlin first, she's nodding. So I feel like maybe she has some ideas already and we'll let Catherine, Louisa and Sasha brainstorm. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so piece of advice is just to be gentle with yourself. Like, you know, the transition to university is different for everyone. Some people take to it really well, some people maybe need a little bit more time to adjust and there's absolutely no shame in that. Um, comparing yourself to other people and being like, oh, well, they're doing so great, you know, it's, it's only going to make it harder for yourself and there's no point in it really um you know just give yourself the time to adjust the time to make mistakes to you know stumble a little bit it's okay um it's all sort of a part of the process and um you know if you just give yourself the, the time to adjust like it will be okay and and you will uh you know find yourself a, an integral part of the community in in no time um, so yeah, just really be gentle with yourself because I feel like a lot of people don't take the time to be proud of themselves for like how far they've come. They're just like on to the next goal. So yeah, just take the time. You've made it this far. There's no reason that you can't make it again. Um, and then the one thing to bring, Canada is actually deceivingly hot in September, especially if you are in an un in a yeah. See everyone, everyone's nodding. I'm <laughs> correct about this. If you are in an unair conditioned residence, so that would be RVC, Douglas, any of the upper residences, I think Solon as well, I highly recommend bringing a fan. The dorm, room, dorm rooms get hot and stuffy, and there's not like, I mean, you have windows, but it's not a ton of airflow. I, especially if you're the kind of person who gets hot, I really recommend bringing a fan or buying one. Um, even just like a small one that you can like clip to your little headboard or put on your desk because yeah or like when you're studying in your room you can have it blowing because september is like weirdly hot in canada um so yeah that's my piece of advice for what to bring awesome i feel like sasha connected with the fan recommendation anything else sasha you'd like to to leave our, our attendees with <laughs> yeah the fan trust me um i was expecting to wear my big jacket much earlier than i had to um I will say, um, item to bring, a rice cooker. Uh, buy yourself a rice cooker. It's, you just throw rice in it. The rice is made middle of the night. You're studying. It's great to have. And also, don't overlook investing in a really good pair of winter shoes. I stuck with my Stan Smith until mid-December and yeah. slipped and fell. Yeah, see? And slipped and fell much, much too many, too many times. My back is still, well, not thanking me for it. Invest in a good pair of like Timberlands or winter boots or or something. And if I 
had to give a piece of advice um, for a first year student is don't romanticize your experience. Everyone expects this crazy university experience and you'll get it. Like it will be there, but I personally made the mistake of focusing too much on one thing, on one set of people I made on my residence experience. Whereas I made most of my friends through extracurriculars. Some people make most of their friends through through other people, some through posh, some through residences. Like really just don't romanticize it. Have expectations for yourself, but not necessarily for your experience because your experience is gonna unravel no matter what. As long as you're willing to leave your door open and meet some people, honestly speaking, you're gonna do just fine. So like Caitlin said, take care of yourself and honestly, don't be afraid to let go of a couple of people with who are nice, but to get with like real friends. Perfect, and Luis and Catherine, to wrap it up. Yeah, um, so that's really great advice, I would say. Um, mine is kind of based off of what um, or maybe Sasha was saying a little bit earlier about extracurriculars, but I would say really get involved. Like I only started getting involved in extracurriculars in second year. And that's actually one of my biggest regrets because it's been like one of the best parts of my second year. I've met so many amazing people. I've been feel like I'm feeling like I'm part of like a community of people who share my interests. Like, it's the best thing I ever did. And I wish I'd done that in first year as well because it would have, like maybe it would have even made my transition easier. So I would say definitely get involved. Um, and the same with like the events that McGill hosts. Like McGill is hosting all these orientation and frosh events so that you can make friends. And even though it might be kind of like nerve wracking, um, if you're like, oh, but personally, for example, on one of my days of frosh, I don't know who to like walk down to the event. It was like the first day of frosh and I didn't know who to walk to the event with because like I had like one, like I feel like one of my friends was like going with other people and I like kind of didn't want to be a scrape. And then I was like, no, I'm just going to do it. And then I ended up, she's now my roommate. I'm just saying like all these things, you just have to kind of go for it and push yourself and remember, don't be too hard on yourself, but at the same time, give yourself that little extra push because I think when you do participate in those events and you do kind of join in with people and what they're doing, it will make your transition easier. Um, and then in terms of like a uh, item, I would say, I, I feel like this is gonna sound so obvious, but slides, as an international student, mm -hmm. they are not a big thing. Like slides are just not really a big thing. Like pool slides. Yeah, like and like if you're, if you're in upper res, for example, and you wanna go to the shower, like you're gonna need slides because it's kind of great. Like it's kind <laughs> of great. It's part of the university experience, great res, loved it, but like you're probably gonna need slides. And also if it's, like let's say it's kind of later at night and you just want to go to BMH, which was like the Bishop Mass or it's like the um what was I gonna say, the cafeteria, you're not gonna like you might not wanna put on your trainers. You're like, I just wanna kinda of run out quickly, get a snack. The slides will be the way to go. So get a pair of slides. <laughs> and and my advice is um basically don't worry so much as the parents were so worried that they're you know going to be a lo lonely or there's something's going to go wrong and they will thrive it's and it's harder on us I think than it is on them and they may have a few wobbles here and there but it's going to be fine and the practical advice I would say is the two pieces of kit that I think are indispensable is a mattress cover because you people bring their own bedding but a mattress cover just makes you feel like that yeah. you know just makes you feel a little more a little bit better and, and a kettle, I think. Um, mm. It's just everybody probably will want a kettle in their own room. I mean, there, there is a little kitchen on in, in, in most places, yeah. but you don't want to have to go and out. You, you just want to get to make yourself a cup of tea or coffee or whatever. So those are my, my fun facts or fun tips. And if can I, I can add on one last thing, um, don't put too much pressure on the courses that you're registering for right now. Uh, at the beginning of each semester, there's a two-week period mm -hmm. called Add Drop where if you're not feeling the course or you misunderstood what it was, you can drop the course and register for another one. It's a, it's a two week period where there are no graded assignments theoretically. And it's, it's honestly a great time to kind of just explore. I know that I was all set. I had my five courses. I did not take a single one of the one I had registered for in my first semester because I found some other ones that were better for my degree that I hadn't heard about or were more interesting. So don't put too much pressure on the courses you're registering for right now. I just want to add one thing to bring that I or like to buy um, because I know a lot of international students probably worried about the Canadian winter 
my recommendation is a scarf like a really big scarf because what a lot of people don't expect i think is that the wind is actually a really big problem in canada and that's what gets icy because like the, your jacket ends here and you're you know you got this exposed piece of neck so if you have a scarf and it covers like this lower half of your face and your neck that honestly keeps you the warmest more than a hat or anything like that so i would recommend a really nice thick scarf I love this so much because it's really practical advice and I think you brought in so much to this. So if you've all recorded your checklist so far, I'm thinking fan, maybe the rice cooker. Uh, we have a kettle. Um, if you want to stay warm, the scarf. And I think that's great to cover up and be cozy because even when it's hot out, a lot of our buildings with air conditioning, you get cold anyway. So the scarf is super important. And then footwear. So whether it's in the middle of slushy, snowy weather, you want some really solid boots. Um, and the slides or flip-flops as we might call them those are super important to have in your uh, residential spaces and such so there we go we've given you some tips hopefully um, this has been so much fun I think this panel is fantastic we could probably talk for hours and hours on how to make your transition to university so smooth so smooth um, but many of you are joining us and it's late at night, so you're probably ready to at least go to sleep or have dinner um, or move move on. So uh, we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Caitlin, Catherine, Louisa, and Sasha for being here as well and giving us all your uh, extra advice. I'm gonna take Sasha's um, mention too of just enjoy this time really and caitlin's advice too just you know celebrate where you are now and it will all work out and just again keep researching asking questions uh, but it will all unfold for you so hopefully you don't feel uh too overwhelmed uh congratulations again students you've made it you've done so much tremendous work already you're you're ready for us and to parents and our support networks uh it's great to have you with us as well Keep in mind this recording uh, will be available on our alumni uh, website in the virtual event page. So if you want to come back and reflect on some of the comments and things that were shared, by all means, uh, do that. Um, new parents, you're also going to be invited to um, some virtual parent tent and information activities and such uh, coming up between August 23rd and 27th. So there is a form that you can fill out and it's posted in our chat. So if you want to keep up to date with what is happening for our families uh, and the send offs are not over again, this fun engagement piece continues. And so again, students check your McGill mailboxes um, for some upcoming exclusive networking events uh, through Brazen just to connect with students and parents from around the world. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. If you're still not sure where to start, because we've given you lots of information, the first year website is probably a key one. Um, so if you go to mcgill.ca slash first year, this will again get you started with everything. And I think on my side too, the mcgill.ca slash accepted website, just for those key next steps. And if you do have any more questions, you can also reach out to Campus Life and Engagement uh, at CLE, so clay at mcgill.ca. So thanks again. Uh, we wish you continued good health and happiness. And uh, we do look forward to welcoming you physically and in person uh, to McGill in September. Uh, again, congratulations. We look forward to again having you be part of our McGill community. Uh, so we're going to wrap up our presentation now and end with uh, a McGill video. So uh, please uh, check out our McGill anthem. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Born from a will, made here by dreamers and risk takers, by makers and big thinkers. Through trial and error, we face what's ahead, staying true to the voice that never fails us. Keep learning. We were made for this. Made by lamplight and late nights, by salut and goodbyes, by questioning everything and feeding our curiosity, by testing our resilience, by finding our limits. By pushing forward and by breaking through, by finding a new way, our own way. We're made where ideas are built and built upon, where we come together and we rise above.
We are made by McGill. 